Hey, this is Gretchen Men, the guitar player for Zepparella, and welcome to the Zepparella Learning Channel. In this series, I'm going to be showing you the guitar parts for the Led Zeppelin classic, Cashmere, and we're going to be doing it in the recorded tuning of Dadgad. So beyond being just a colossal musical achievement, Cashmere is so much fun to play, and there are larger lessons in learning it that you can take away and apply to your own music or other aspects of your musical development. And a little side note here, it's like 86, 87, something unbelievably hot in this room, which is why I've got a fan going here. We happen to be shooting these videos during a heat wave in San Francisco, so forgive me. On to Cashmere. Studying the music of your heroes, whether it's Led Zeppelin or anyone else, informs your own musical vocabulary. Not only do you get the fun and education of playing music you love, there are deeper and more universal lessons to be gained along the way. Lessons that can make you a better, more well-rounded musician. My bandmates and I do these free videos as a way of sharing our love of Led Zeppelin and letting you in on what we've learned by studying the music and performing it live. We really hope this series may be helpful, educational, or interesting to others who revere the music as we do. With Cashmere as the model, the two main takeaways I want to emphasize here are the magic and the beauty of dadgad tuning, or any alternate tuning for that matter, as well as the very cool stuff that can happen when you juxtapose two meters against each other. Led Zeppelin's music rarely falls into easy, clear, straightforward verse, chorus kinds of sections. So for the purposes of this video, um, the four sections that, I've, that I'm calling, we have the main verse or the main riff, and that also has a shorter, kind of abbreviated version. We have a descending line, we have a bridge, and we have what I'm calling the chorus. So this is not gospel terminology, other people might call it something else, but this will at least get us on the same page as we go through the different sections of the song. So we'll start by getting our guitar into dadgad tuning. So it is so named for the way that the strings are tuned. So you're gonna tune your low E down to D, full step. A string stays the same. D string stays the same, D. We also have G. And then we're down a whole step here on the B string to A. And down a whole step on the high E string as well to D. So that sounds like as you tune your guitar, you may find, at least I find, that a lot of guitars get kind of fussy when you go to new tuning. So expect to put it in the tuning and then refine the tuning a couple of times before things really settle in. Why an alternate tuning? So the scope of this video isn't to do a deep dive down the infinite rabbit hole of alternate tunings. But um, because we are in an alternate tuning, uh, we, we should look at it. Um, there are a lot of advantages of alternate tunings. Um, they allow for certain things to be playable that are not otherwise playable. They allow for uh, strings to be droning and ringing out um, in different keys. And um, they also allow for certain, um, for me at least, is it's disorienting to play in an alternate tuning. There are some people like Adrian Legg, and that's his thing, and he probably is really oriented on the fretboard no matter what tuning he's in. But um, for me at least, it's disorienting in a way that can also be very creatively inspiring. So when you pick up your guitar and things are tuned differently, you can use either familiar fingerings and be surprised as to the different sounds that now come out, or um, you can mess around playing with different chords, different riffs, and find that sometimes it can be very inspiring. I know the first time that I actually tried to write something in Dadgad, I was kind of shocked as to how many ideas flowed out. So it can be a really fun exercise um, for coming up with new creative ideas as well. And this whole song, this whole riff, is um, very much to me tied to the sound of Dadgad, um, because we have these constantly droning D and A notes that are just part of the sound and part of the beauty of the riff. This is one of my favorite riffs of all time. I would even venture to say that it's one of the coolest and most iconic in the rock catalog, and it's brought to you by Dadgad Tuning. It's very much tied to the tuning and you have these, this kind of um, almost chromatic upper voice juxtaposed against these just kind of pounding D notes. And that in and of itself is really cool, but things get really strange when you start looking at the meter. So the way the riff goes, at least at the top, is... <laughs> So the riff 
in isolation has kind of a triple feel to it, meaning that every third beat, that top voice changes. And that's what kind of implies this triple feel. But it's played against drums that are in 4-4. Four, four. Some people would call that a polymeter or just Led Zeppelin. To make matters even stranger, the riff starts with a variation of itself. So if we were to, if I were to kind of isolate the part of the riff that repeats, it actually starts like and then that's the riff. But because the first thing we hear is that riff starting on A and hanging there longer than it does any other time other than when it comes out of the first chorus, that kind of sets a tone in our ears that when, we, when the second time comes around and the third time comes around, everything feels kind of odd. Uh, so everything about this riff is odd and beautiful and the way that it kind of works its way um, to settling in with the drums is very cool. So let me play it from the top and then I'll show you where, where it kind of settles in because what happens at first is by starting with this variation of the riff, it means that initially you're kind of playing like three measures of 4-4 four, four, or you can also think about it, four measures of 3-4 while the drums are playing in 4-4. Four, four. In any case, it's 12 beats before things really line up with the drums, and that's when the verse starts. So, it sounds like this. So let me show you how to play this riff. The way that I fret it is that my fourth finger is on the fifth fret of the A string. So we've got D, as well as a unison D with the open string and then the octave D below. And then your first finger is going to be on the G string, and it's just going to work its way up from A to B flat to B natural to C to D. So that's, and on the picking pattern or the, um, the rhythmic pattern, Pay attention to where this low D comes in. So you have rest, low D, and then rest, low D. So the, the pattern, um, if you want to look at it, is these tiny little cells. Is you have uh, the two sixteenth notes, an eighth note, and then an eighth note rest and then you have the two sixteenth notes, an eighth note, and then the low D. So rhythmically, you can kind of hear how it's in this three, right? That's three beats, and then... But once you hear it with the drums, it takes on a totally different character. And the vocal also implies this 4-4. This, uh, four, four. So you kind of have this guitar swirling around in its own little world. And even when it does end up joining up with the rest of the band, with those um, downbeats happening with... Uh, with D, you know, um, that law of primacy, because we first heard that riff starting there, um, it takes a while to actually feel those downbeats in the same way. There's also an abbreviated version of this riff that happens between these descending lines. So what that is, is you're, you're actually starting with a rest, right? So, and you're starting, rather than on A or on D, you're starting on B flat here. So once again, something else to keep it odd, you have B flat, B, C, and then you go into the descending riff. To me, this is another very iconic part of the song. I should mention there's a very interesting video of Jimmy Page talking about this in the documentary, It Might Get Loud, and he talks about that I think this actually was something um, that was going to be in a song called Swan Song. But the part, which is a total, I mean, to me, this is why it's in Dadgad. I mean, you could play the rest of the riff with just a drop D, but this to me is why it's in Dadgad. 
So you're here at your 12th fret. I'm going to be talking frets instead of notes because I think for most of us, um, once we're in the alternate tuning, it's disorienting. Here at the 12th fret, so that's your third finger on the G string and your fourth finger on your highest string. The fingering is going to pretty much stay the same, just alternating between your third finger and your second finger and moving down the neck. So we're going to start here at the 12th fret. So. 10th fret, 7th fret, 7th fret, and then that's a pull off from the 3rd uh, fret of the D string to the 2nd fret to the open string. And then that repeats. That's your descending line. So it's Zeppelin, it's already weird, and now it just has to get a little bit weirder. The way I interpret it, I feel like is less weird than some of the transcriptions I see. It's basically a bar of how a lot of people transcribe it is 9-8, and it goes into this bridge section. I don't interpret it as 9-8, and rather than get into like you know music theory squabbling, I'll explain to you why I transcribed it the way that I did. In 9-8, it is um, it is compound triple feel. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. Um, to me, I don't hear that. What I hear is basically that things are con continuing in the same beat, and then you have this little tag. This is Zeppelin. I don't hear it as like, we're now changing to a compound meter. I hear it is that they just left off a beat, and they did something weird. However you want to interpret it is fine, but I feel like that's how it is spelt. And um, so the way that sounds is you have this descending line. And then. So rather than trying to count it in 9-8, I just say play the descending riff and then memorize. So what that is, is third fret, you're on the F, E, D. Actually, I play, I think I play that with the fret, yeah. I play that actually fretted, but you could play it with the open string too. So F, E, D, A, B, D. And then that takes you into your bridge. Okay, so the bridge. And actually this is kind of a cool part for me because every time before I do these videos, I do extra research. Even though going into this, I tried to be really diligent about my studies and about um, not taking anything for granted when it comes to Zeppelin, um, there's always new information coming out and new isolated tracks you can find on YouTube and things like that. And last night, I found um, a, an instrumental version of, um, of Kashmir that I'll link below. What was great about it for me is I was able to hear in a section that tends to be really densely textured with all of these other, all this other instrumentation, I was able to hear the guitar riff a little bit more clearly. If you check out our version of Kashmir, it's actually not how I'm playing it, but I know better now, and the way I see it is I'm a work in progress, and every day I try to be a better guitar player. So uh, I learned something last night, and here it is for you guys. So what that is, is A, A5, and then you're putting the F sharp in for a second. I will say that I have heard Jimmy do that live, but because Nobody takes more liberties with Jimmy Page than Jimmy Page. I just kind of thought, oh, that's you know a little variation he's doing in this live version. But he did do it on the album. Um, and uh, it's great to be able to hear that with greater detail. So again, the going into the bridge. The part that I am calling the chorus. Um, Really, you are just going between G and A. So that on in Dadgad looks like this. And I confess that typically live, I don't follow a really strict rhythmic pattern. And I don't think that's really Jimmy Page to follow a very strict rhythmic pattern, especially when the role of the guitar in this section, I think, becomes much more supportive. It's supposed to be providing a bed for the vocal to soar. And, um, and also, in the recorded version, you have a, a very thick, dense, sort of orchestrated sound here. So some of the accents of the guitar are really hard to hear. I was able to hear them better on um, the uh, instrumental track that, that I'll link. But um, so what I've transcribed is kind of a very literal version of it. 
Um, but I would actually suggest in playing this live, learn it if you like. It's a question of balancing the letter and the spirit, and I kind of feel like it's better to play with your band. It's better to support your vocalist. If your vocalist wants to stretch out and take liberties, as Robert Plant absolutely did, if your drummer is adding some cool fills and stuff like that, play with your band. But here is how um, an approximation of that rhythm part goes. <laughs> playing a lot with the off beats, you know? So he's, he's hitting that, that strong one. I'm sorry, I'm gonna retune. See, this is exactly what happens when you put a guitar into a new tuning and it's like, who am I? I don't even know. The, the main points I think to take away in this section are hit those chord changes firmly on the downbeat and then play within your band. So, you know. Good luck with this. I hope it's helpful. And I always like to leave people with a writing assignment should they choose to do so. Writing is how I really internalize something. It's how I learn and it's how I'm able to take something from my heroes and try to start incorporating it into my own vocabulary. Try writing something in Dadgad. As I mentioned previously, when I first tuned up an acoustic guitar to Dadgad and started messing around, I was like, oh my god, it's not a question of finding ideas, it's a question of editing down all the ideas that I'm finding, which is a really wonderful feeling to have. So try writing something in Dadgad. Suggestion two is try coming up with something um, in a meter other than 4-4 and playing it against drums in 4-4. Uh, this one is a great place to start, 3-4 against 4-4, because it's not, unless you've done this before, um, it's not overly fussy. And I think it, it can still give a very cool effect without you having to do too much like mental math in the process of coming up with a riff. Thank you so much for checking this out. I do hope it was helpful. The second video of this series is going to be how I approach a very densely orchestrated piece of music as the sole guitar player in a band and certain things I can do to try to fill in melodies and textures as I can while not neglecting my guitar duties. See you there.